Hello, I'm Susan Matthews. I am Slate's news director, uh, and I'd like to welcome you all to another social distancing social from Future Tense, uh, a partnership between Slate, New America, and Arizona State University. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about how the pandemic has upended the meat supply chain. And I am joined by Henry Grabar, a staff writer at Slate, and Chris Leonard, uh, who is the author of the Meat Racket, The Secret Takeover of America's Food Business, and Cokeland, The Secret History of the Coke Industries and Corporate Power in America. Henry and Chris, welcome. Thank you for being here. Thanks. Uh, so I wanted to start by asking a sort of simple question, which is that for me during the coronavirus, I have started to realize that a lot of things that I thought were similar are not actually as similar. So when I used to go into just my chain grocery store, I was kind of like, oh, I'm buying things that are not necessarily local or not necessarily the right thing to buy, but they're all kind of the things that I buy in the grocery store. The thing that I feel like I have learned <laughs> during this pandemic is the meat is a lot worse, <laughs> uh, or that's how it, uh, it seems to me. So I wanted to start by asking you both basically what is the deal with the meat that we buy in the grocery store and why is it different than many of the other things we're buying in the grocery store right now? Henry, you want to start? I don't want to like just jump in. Well, I, I guess one important thing to understand about meat in the United States is that there is enormous consolidation in packing, particularly with pork, less so with uh, cattle and poultry. Um, but what you're seeing during the COVID-19 outbreak is uh, that some of these plants that control a gigantic section of food packaging, of meat packaging in the United States have been hit with the virus. And so uh, I don't know if you saw the story in the Washington Post the other day, but um, let's see. So the number, for example, at uh, Tyson's, which uh, is a big um, chicken uh, processing company that probably sells chicken in your local supermarket, they're not, the number of employees that Tyson alone that have uh, COVID-19 is up to, I think, 7,000. Um, and so you're starting to see all these plants get shut down. And, and you're starting to realize that for me, there's this enormous bottleneck that's built into the system at the packing houses. And I don't know if there's an equivalent to that for something like lettuce or pasta. I, I can say that there's, there's really not, uh, to be honest. I mean, uh, across all these kinds of foods, you see consolidation in agriculture. You know, a few big companies process a lot of the uh, food products we eat. Like, you know how corn is, is milled into all these different products. Basically, four companies control that. But meat is meat. Meat is very extreme in how consolidated it is. You know, four companies produce about eighty-five percent of all the beef. Um, you know, two companies, Tyson Foods and Golden Pride, produce about half of the chicken. So it's extremely consolidated, um, and just as, just as Henry described. And you know, one one detail I'd like to throw in there is that when you go into the grocery store, you see this monopoly of different brand names. You know, you might see like twelve different brand names and all these different choices. Most of those do trace back to the big four. So it's really this illusion that there's all this diversity. Almost all of the new products you buy will trace back to the four big. And, and 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 I also have to say, Henry kind of touched on this. It's not just that four companies control it. You know, their strategy for decades has been to consolidate the actual production and the slaughter. What they're trying to do is move for producing meat in as few slaughterhouses as possible and as large of slaughterhouses as possible. Because that's how you that's how you maximize the profit margin. I mean, we can talk about the whole thing, but in essence, they invest millions and millions of dollars to build these mega slaughterhouses. And when you do that, you just want to run as many animals through as possible. So it's 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 pushing all of our meat production into a, not just a few, but uh, relatively few giant slaughterhouses, if that makes sense. And that exact construction of just a few mega slaughterhouses that have to run at maximum capacity, have to have lots and lots of workers inside 
at all times working on them is exactly what made them so vulnerable to the pandemic. So, I mean, I think this is the first time we've seen something like this. Uh, chicken poultry in particular is notorious for workers facing dangerous and sometimes abusive conditions on the line. Um, in many cases, it's tied to the work, the nature of the workforce itself, which is composed um, largely of immigrants in many places. Uh, so these are uh, vulnerable workers who may not feel comfortable, um, you know, going to HR. Uh, poultry is less unionized than pork and beef is. Um, so generally, those plants have had a reputation for being not great workplaces. Um, I don't know if there's ever been a parallel to what we're seeing right now, but uh, it certainly seems that the bigger plants have been the ones where this thing has really taken off and that they haven't been able to, uh, I mean, they, 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 they've been saying that they're installing things like temperature checks and plexiglass screens and all, and all this kind of stuff, but, um, but ultimately it's not clear if those protections are going to be enough to change the fundamental nature of the work, which is that all these workers work in very close proximity um, and, uh, and in an environment that seems to be pretty conducive to transmitting the virus. Right. And I know, Henry, that you've done a bunch of reporting on these workers specifically. Um, and I was wondering, when we, when we look back at the past couple months about what has happened in these factories, like how, I think that there was a period of time where there was like a real worry that this could happen in these factories, but there wasn't really any push to shut them down because it would be so catastrophic to the supply chain to, to shut them down. And then the outbreak started happening and, uh, you know, there have been some closures, but it seems to me from my read that a lot of factories are, are opening back up right now. And the question is really how safe is, are the procedures that they're opening in there. And also, as you mentioned, this is a particularly vulnerable population that are the workers in, in these in these factories. And so how does that factor in? I am gone. <laughs> we can still hear you, Henry. All right. Well I'm 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 still you here. can be a disembodied voice <laughs> for a moment. Uh to answer your question, I I uh I don't have a lot of faith in meatpacking companies to make permanent changes that will ensure the, uh, you know, uh, safety and well-being of their workforces. Um, I think the, the parallel that I'm most familiar with is with uh, immigration raids, where you've seen immigration authorities come down on these plants and say, you've been employing all these illegal um, uh, workers using stolen social security numbers or something like that. And in some cases, these are massive uh, disruptions, like in with the Postville raid in uh, 2008, uh, where you saw hundreds of, of people arrested, the whole town's economy basically, and, and, and even the society basically uh, ruined. And uh, after a while, business returns to normal. So I, I don't know that, uh, you know, if they are able to keep production moving, I don't know that you know, that they're going to go out of their way to really um, take care of their workforce. Yeah, I mean, could I color that in a little bit? Mm -hmm. yeah. I, mean, I think Henry's exactly right. Everything he just said. Um, the, the problem is, let's assume that today you're Tyson Foods and you're running a huge hundred, multi-hundred million dollar slaughterhouse where hundreds if not thousands of employees are working shoulder to shoulder, side by side. They get dressed in crowded locker rooms. They eat lunch in very crowded cafeterias. There's a reason these have become COVID hotspots. They're very, very dense work environments. And um, for, for, for Tyson to slow it down, it doesn't just disrupt the, the supply chain, but it, it it could be a massive hit to their, their profitability, as I said. I mean, the whole purpose of these plants is to run full speed around the clock. So they've been faced with this choice of trying to go in and, and radically retrofit these plants because these plants have been built with one goal in mind, mm -hmm. as much production as fast as possible with as many employees on the ship as you can get. 
And so now to try to slow that machine down, to get in and try to fix it, to make you know workers stand further apart, to put dividers between them. I mean, we're talking about a massive retrofit, which is not impossible by any means, but it sure as heck is going to slow down production and hurt their profit margin. And go ahead, sorry. Well, one other question that I had is that that's obviously the incentive of the, the factory owners in this situation. But one thing that I've been reading a lot about, too, about the people who work in the processing plants is that this is a population that is largely low income. It's uh, people who work a lot of overtime, who rely on a lot of overtime in order to you know, supplement their wages. And so when their hours are cut, and also even when they're forced to take sick leave, uh, that's a really big problem for them. So they want the safety, but they also need to be working the amount of time based on how their pay is constructed. So it's kind of an interesting, it's like a, a push on, on both sides in, in some ways. That's, that's long been the dilemma in some of these places. After the raids in Mississippi last summer, you saw some Democratic politicians saying, well, how come the workers are being punished but there haven't been any fines on the companies. And they started saying, well, we're going to go in and we're going to take these poultry processing companies and we're going to we're going to make sure that they pay the price for employing undocumented immigrants. And the result of that is that they fire everybody. So yeah. it's one of the it's it, it's, you know, it, it speaks to the larger picture, which is that until there is a federal uh, there is federal action on undocumented immigrants in this country, there there are no good solutions at the local level for for this imbalance that that exists and, and you're right that you know it doesn't doesn't do these poultry workers any favors necessarily um to see these plants downsize or, or shut down chris i'm curious if you've heard if you have any thoughts on what you think one of these large operating factories could do right now to make things safer and better for their workers that maybe they are trying to do or maybe they are saying that they're doing? Well, they face the, the same dilemma every single business is facing right now. You need to create space between workers. You need to reduce the density of employees, for example, in the locker room, in the cafeteria, and then out there on that factory floor. You know, um, Henry, I'm sure you've been in like a poultry plant on the quote D-bone line where workers are cutting apart these chickens, they are standing shoulder to shoulder. And that's, you're gonna see that in pork and beef and chicken. These are very high intensity operations. Uh, and so what you need to do is create physical space between workers and then stagger your workforce or, or create some way that people can be at a safe distance from one another. That's very, very difficult because I can't overstate enough. These companies have been pushing in one direction for decades as few plants as possible, as many workers working as hard as they can for as long as they can in very high density operation. And um, I did want to follow up, you know, Henry pointed out this is very much by design. I mean, these companies have very intentionally broken labor unions, sought out employees who are going to be hesitant to speak up so that the employees don't have a voice or a bargaining power when it comes to figuring out how to make these adjustments. You know, right now, the company's approach seems to be metal to the metal. You know, wear a face mask, we're going to stay on that same line. We're going to keep our shifts at the same number of employees and just hope you don't get sick, basically. And, and also that the USDA has gone along with this. And the USDA has said that the lines can speed up. I mean, this is just, even in the last few years, we've seen decisions saying that, they, you know, uh, pork processors can inspect their own plants instead of having state inspectors come, uh, that, that, that lines can speed up, meaning like the literal pace of meat moving along the conveyor belt can go faster than it could previously. That obviously puts more pressure on workers um, and makes the job more, more dangerous and, and more uh, difficult. Um, but it also increases the economies of scale at which these larger plants operate, right? So when you have a plant with a thousand workers in a giant conveyor belt full of meat, uh, moving, uh, moving all that meat, you know, uh, across the factory floor in 55 seconds instead of uh, 57 seconds, uh, that makes a big difference when you're processing millions and millions of chickens. That advantage isn't going to accrue in the same way to a mom and pop slaughterhouse that's got 10 people working around a table. Um, so the federal government has deregulated in such a way that both makes conditions more dangerous for workers. Um, 
and increases the incentives to consolidate, which is why we're seeing the problems we're seeing now. So I wanted to talk about, we have one question from the audience that hits on something I wanted to talk about anyway, which is from Michael Szymanski, who asked, would it be advisable to push for smaller, more regional meat processing facilities, which I think the answer is yes. But one thing that I've been thinking about a lot during this time is I reported a story from a farm in Georgia several years ago, White Oak Pastures. It's a farm where the it's like a fifth generation farmer in really rural Georgia. His father was a cattle farmer and he eventually completely redid his farm via the savory method where he diversified what he had on his on his land. He had chickens and cattle that were, you know, moving all around and it was a whole cycle. And he had he had just gotten USDA approval for his slaughterhouses, uh, both a cattle slaughterhouse and a chicken slaughterhouse on site. And when I was there, I was there reporting on bald eagles. Actually, I was working at Audubon magazine at the time. But when I was there, he was like so interested in telling me about this and was talking about how, what a big deal it was that he had his slaughterhouses on site and I like didn't really get it but now <laughs> I feel like I, I really get it and I'm curious and the thing is obviously is that his products were more expensive he sold things directly to consumers and he sold to Whole Foods and it was just the price of his meat was higher and that to me seems like the first barrier but i'm curious uh for both of you what, what are the other barriers to getting to what seems to me to be an obviously more advisable approach of, of having smaller regional meat processing facilities well I, i'd like to jump in i mean henry just talked about how the company has been speeding up the lines um meat companies have written our public policy around the meat industry for 30 or 40 years, they have written policy. And one of the things they've been most interested in is consolidating ownership. You know, companies have um, basically overturned antitrust laws that used to block mergers and, and keep competition. We've moved away from that in this country. So what all these companies did is they bought out their competitors and then they shut down the smaller slaughterhouses and moved all the production into these mega slaughterhouses. So what I, the reason I'm talking about this is when we revert to a more decentralized regional meat system, we're not even talking about, you know, mom and pop farmers with the chicken coop. I mean, we're talking about you can still have pretty large scale industrialized facilities, just not these mega highly consolidated facilities. I mean, back in 1978, 38 companies in the chicken business controlled half the market, 38. We had a lot of chicken back then. It wasn't like people were going short. Now, two companies own that same share of the market. So I, I don't think it's necessarily this choice between this extraordinarily consolidated system we have today and then very small scale farms. There's so much we could do by promoting competition, uh, you know, decentralization and, and breaking apart the big meat companies to get us much closer to a system where you have some resiliency, you know, which is exactly what we don't have today. One of, one of the, sorry, Henry, did you want to go ahead? Well, I, I, I obviously there's two ends to that, right? It's like, number one, are consumers willing to pay uh, an extra $2 on every pound of ground beef, um, which is made because it, 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 you know, one of the, what the industry would say is the great success story of the last 30 or 40 years is that meat has gotten so cheap. I mean, meat used to be a, a luxury for many people. And, and nowadays it's just, it's just astonishingly cheap. And that is, that is kind of the trade-off that we we've, we've made. Um, I saw an article in Politico several days ago that said that um, direct to consumer meat is flourishing right now because, um, because of these bottlenecks, basically that people are um, kind of, taking this opportunity to investigate how they might begin to procure meat from a local farm around them or something like that. And uh, I also saw an article um, about a, uh, a, a group of cattle producers in South Dakota um, that are restarting a small beef packing plant that's been closed for um, 17 years. And it's basically exactly what you've been saying. You know, they're thinking uh, with six to eight employees working five days a week, you know, not these 24 hour uh, around the clock operations and they'll be able to 
insulate themselves from COVID-19. It'll be a lot easier to sort of manage their workforce. It'll be a more humane workforce. and also mean uh, more control for the producers. Of course, that only works if someone's out there willing to buy what presumably is going to be uh, sort of premium uh, premium price beef. And, and I hope that they are. I think that there's a sign that there are, there are consumers out there. Um, the last thing I'll say about that is that I also saw uh, Senator John Thune of South Dakota say uh, a couple of days ago that he wanted an investigation into how uh, packing has become so consolidated. So, um, and, and this is in an interview in the context of COVID-19. So while some of these trends may be independent of, of the pandemic, it, it seems like maybe the pandemic is the moment where people start to realize that there is um, weakness in the consolidation of, of packing industry as well as low prices. Well, one question that I had, one of the truly horrific stories that has come out of this is the stories of the farmers who, who raise the cattle and the pigs and the way that they, when the factories are shut down, they can't send their cattle to the slaughterhouses and they've had to euthanize them themselves and the like actual trauma that it seems like is coming out of the the farmers having to do that. And so my question is, it, is that an event that before the the farmer was sort of bought into this system and now the farmers at that level have a good reason to not be bought into this system? Is that one of the turning points where that ends up being those people are coming together to say, actually, we can have our own slaughterhouse here. We can have we can we can do this at a more local level. Well, you know, the, the current structure started with the chicken business. And that was the first meat business that was really industrialized. And one of the key components of, you know, streamlining and industrializing meat production was um, taking over the farm. The, the companies took over the farms through the contracting process. So the farmers own the land, they own the house, but they grow animals under contract for the company. So the company really has total control over the farm. The chicken industry built out that network and then used their cash to build out a similar network in the pork industry. And as they built out all these highly industrialized pork farms, it sucked the oxygen out of the open market. And, and the reason I'm talking about this is because they, they sucked the oxygen out of the market that independent farmers used to survive. So people really didn't have a choice over the decades. You either raise a large scale on a factory farm under contract for a major company, or you're not really in business. I mean, you can try to make a go of it um, as a sell directly to producer, small farm. Some people have been very successful on that, but by and large, um, your viable producers who do this for a living are gonna have to raise under contract uh, for a company and have very large operations. That's what's been going on for 30 or 40 years. So now, it is very difficult to be independent. I mean, we're, we're in a position where we've destroyed the markets where an independent producer used to be able to sell their product. And again, Henry talked about the bottleneck. I mean, you've got to work with these big four meat producers or you can't really get your products to market. So uh, to create a change would take a lot of time and a lot of work is, is my thinking on that. So, you know, there are big, big forces that have pushed us into this position where we are now. I think that's that's all right. I and I would add that um, while uh, cattle producers or or hog farm cattle producers or hog farmers may feel that they have little agency, um, when I reported this story from Fremont, Nebraska, Costco had basically installed this gigantic chicken plant in a region that was not full of chicken farmers. It wasn't like they were displacing an organic ecosystem of chicken farming that led straight to the supermarkets in Omaha, right? Like this was a company coming in and as uh, Chris was saying, like um, signing these extremely restrictive contracts with neighboring farmers, many of whom had never raised chickens before in their lives, or if they had, it was a childhood chicken coop or something like that. But, but Costco would come in and say, you know, you build this chicken barn. Here's how the financing works. We own the chickens from 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 the egg to the slaughter, and you just take care of them for us. So uh, the chicken farming goes where the plants go, right? It's not like 
it's not like the you know that if the Costco plant shut down, that those farmers would still be there and they'd be starting their own thing. And I imagine that um, that if if Costco were to you know close that plant and move away or threaten to close it because of a unionization effort or something, that those the chicken business, the chicken raising business in that area would dry up uh, and it would go somewhere else where processing plant is open. Right. Uh, another question from the audience is if inspections become an issue when you start to decentralize the slaughterhouses. I, I think that's actually one of the largest hurdles. It's really fascinating. The way our inspections regime is set up is that the company, and Henry, this might have changed too, something like with the line speed changes, but basically the company has to pay for USDA inspector to be on site. And it's a very costly program. It helps food safety, uh, but it's, it, it means that if I was to open up a small slaughterhouse here in Maryland, I would have to get a USDA inspector on site. That's a lot of paperwork, that's a lot of money. And that's been a huge hurdle to getting new people to come into business. Uh, it's not insurmountable. It's just that people need to pay attention to this and try to help change the law so it's more amenable to competition. But that's been one of the big problems with the companies that control the policy. I think that's, I and that goes to one of the things you were saying earlier, Susan. One, obviously, one thing that distinguishes meat from everything else that you buy in the supermarket is that it is a more fragile supply chain from start to finish. And it's not. It's not like getting crackers or something like that. And, and that, that makes everything a little more complicated. Well, that, that kind of leads me to my next question, which is the, the pandemic aside, I think that there also has been a lot of conversation recently about how, how much meat we should be eating. And you mentioned, Henry, that like the prices of meat have gone way down, which allows us to eat it much, much more. And there's obviously the question of climate change that comes up here about how sustainable it is for all of us to be eating meat uh, in, at the amounts that we do. And if one part of the solution here is consumers really realizing that the amount of cheap meat that they're eating is is too much and that there's a there's a demand for that going down. I would be surprised if Americans are actually eating less meat. I haven't seen any statistics about that, but um, but it seems unlikely to me, given the horror stories we've seen about factory farming and uh, the last 15 years, it's the thing that finally uh, changes consumers' minds about the ethics of eating meat is. Um, yeah, but Susan, you bring up like a great point, and it's really hard to talk about. The fact is, we eat way more meat than we so cheap. One thing to centralize my diet is. Well, prior to the COVID pandemic, it provided us with a steady supply of food, which is me. But when you ever start talking about reducing consumption and it wouldn't be a bad thing, uh, you got to tackle the, the problem of meat being a source of protein for, you know, um, you know low-income people maybe it's a source of protein that when you start talking about making it more expensive, that's a super, super touchy issue because then people might have less protein in their diet. And believe me, I've been on the circuit talking about this stuff. And I've been so hammered by vegans at every single place where I talk. And they will point out, you do not need meat for a healthy diet. You just don't. But when you face the reality of somebody working two jobs and trying to feed their family, um, meat is a huge part of, of people's everyday diet. So yeah, we could totally eat less meat and um, you know, some of the shortages we're seeing today are real but they're also very specific you know like um, boneless chicken breasts might disappear but there will still be other cuts of meat that just aren't as high of a quality so you can still you know 
get the nutrition you need. Uh, it's just not as, as specialized of a product. So what I'm saying is like, you can survive, you can feed your family. There can be more that you can do. And we've done without meat in the past at this level for sure. But it's hard to talk about it because the meat industry for sure accuses you of, you know, wanting people to not have food. Yeah. Do you think, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say, you know, you can see how there there is an alternate model where meat is slightly more expensive. Uh, the industry is made up of is slightly less consolidated. Money is more spread around uh, and more local, um, and meat consumption is slightly lower uh, because prices are higher. But um, but I agree that 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 may be that may be a tough sell. On the other hand, the fact that you have Republican center from South Dakota calling for inspection into basically consolidation gives me hope that maybe that could be the uh, path we might go down. And can I please jump in here really quick? I get so, I mean, you're totally right. Meat is cheap. Uh, back, it's, it's particularly cheap when you adjust for inflation and compare to how much it costs to raise a pig or raise a chicken back in like the 1940s industrializing this process made a pound of meat cheaper. But I, I must point out, the, 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 the meat industry today is not competitive. It's controlled by an oligopoly and monopolistic companies like Tyson Foods and JBS. And the data is totally clear that, for example, in the chicken business, they've been steadily raising chicken prices for years. And Tyson Foods' profit margin before this pandemic hit was this crazily predictable, ever larger profit margin year by year. There's been so much written about this and there's some huge private sector antitrust lawsuits that have been filed. So yes, relatively it's cheaper, but they have been raising prices uh, because they've done a good job of stifling competition. Well, one question that I wanted to ask is these problems that we're seeing in America with our meat supply chain and but also americans as we know eat more meat is there anything similar to what we're experiencing right now that's happening elsewhere in the world just comparatively henry have you seen anything i feel like particularly in this uh -huh. pandemic the theme of looking at like what's happening here and then looking and seeing if it's a problem anywhere else really helps identify uniquely American pathologies. <laughs> right, and it's usually like not good. I mean, um, I haven't seen, look, Europe, I'm not saying their system's perfect, but it's not nearly as consolidated. And I haven't seen a word about stuff like this going on in Europe. Um, I haven't really read any stories about anything. We, we in terms of consolidation, we lead the pack, we lead the world by like a mile. But then you've also got to disaggregate. We are getting hammered by COVID-19 worse than most other nations for other big reasons. But no, I haven't seen anything like this around the world. Right. Yeah, I don't know the answer to that, sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, we have one more audience question, which is uh, what about looking at other food sources like venison? One thing that I, looked at about the um you know the farmers who have this excess of animals on their property is that they've sent some of them to hunters to be butchered appropriately um and i think that another another theme that i've seen personally with my friends is the desire to like have your own garden during this time and the the resurgence of self-reliance in a in a certain sense i mean does that get us anywhere close to where we need to be. <laughs> sent, you, the the uh, farmers would send a hog to a hunter as a way of like basically circumventing the kind of uh, bottlenecks in the supply chain and like creating a kind of bootleg direct to consumer system. Yeah, I think that it, the thing is, is that they definitely can't sell it if it's been, and Chris, maybe you actually know the answer. This was just from a, a time story about the farmers that were euthanizing their animals, one of the solutions that they had found were, was having some of them locally butchered. And I I would assume that the, that means that you can't then sell the product, that you have to give it away uh, or just consume it yourself or, or something like that. I'm not tuned into that. 
Um, one more question. Uh, how are the plant-based meat substitutes doing during all of this? Like this is kind of their moment, you would think. <laughs> and, um, you know, they have a really good argument right now for why their product might be superior. It's more reliable. It doesn't have some of these labor issues. It doesn't have, uh, you know, a lot of the problems that we're seeing here. Have you seen them trying to take advantage of this specifically? I have not. And, and I do want to point out where we are today. Those products which are having a moment and do have a good case to be made, um, they they were just gaining traction, if you remember, you know, over the last couple of years. They were just starting to break into the mainstream. And they represented a tiny, tiny slice of, if you call it the protein or meat sector, mm -hmm. you know, just the vast majority of the meat that people eat every day is coming from the large big four, you know, Tyson, Cargill, uh, Smith, which is so I feel like they were a niche product that was just starting to gain traction. And um, I have not seen, you know, I think they're facing a lot of the same pressures uh, that, that other companies are doing. That, so I haven't seen like this huge upswing. Well, and I think in particular with the, my, some of my perception with the plant-based products is that people were starting to be really excited to try them in a restaurant and yes. to like have them prepared for you by someone else first and to say like, okay, that was good. Like I could try to make that at home. And now that that distinction or like that opportunity is obviously gone. And so you're not gonna be brave enough to try the, the other thing. And that's maybe part of it with cooking generally too, is that right now we're all cooking for ourselves and we're much more it, like <laughs> we're gearing toward the chicken tenders and the things that are much more simple than perhaps branching out to venison. I, I yeah. think Chris will know more about this than, than I do, but I believe that one of the reasons we now have, one of the reasons that, that these chicken processing plants have become so important is that the way Americans eat chicken has changed. And that, that not only do we eat way more chicken than we used to, but it, we're way more likely to eat chicken that has been pre-cut in a factory into smaller pieces. Um, whereas once upon a time it used to be, you know, a fryer or a broiler in the oven. And that both um, creates this sort of bottleneck at the processing facilities, but it also reminds you that at the end of the day, it's a matter of how you eat and the ways that you know how to prepare food. And if you don't feel comfortable uh, cooking a whole bird like you do, uh, you know, putting a, 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 you know, a deep bone chicken breast in a frying pan, uh, then you're going to have trouble with a, with, a, with, a, with a supply chain that has less processing. Yeah. Yeah. So we're getting uh, close to wrapping up, but I just wanted to ask kind of uh, in particular what your predictions are for what happens next. Do you think that this is a moment that will be taken advantage of to, to change how we make and consume meat in this country? What's your level of hopefulness? <laughs> I think we're in a real pickle right now. This is not good. Uh, I think that the problems of our industry are becoming um, starkly apparent to people. And this is this is a situation that took 40 years to create in terms of such a fragile, such a consolidated system. So uh, the, the problems of this and the vulnerabilities of this are gonna become very apparent, I believe, in the June, July timeframe as this goes on. But it's not like we can just say, okay, let's flip the switch and go back to a more decentralized, robust, competitive system. It will take time. So yes, I think people are gonna become aware of the meat system in a way that they haven't been maybe ever uh, because those vulnerabilities are coming to the fore. But creating change around it is gonna be a time consuming process and that's difficult to predict. That's my thing. Yeah, I think as Chris said, you can't just flip the switch, right? Like, even if Donald Trump gets upset about the possibility of a meat shortage, even he doesn't have that much power to make people go to work when, you know, in some of these meat processing, meat processing and meat producing states, you're talking about a double digit percentage of the state's COVID-19 cases are tied to these meat packing plants. So they really are these absolute epicenters. And um, it's hard to change that without 
changing something very fundamental about the way they work, as Chris says. I, I think the cause for optimism is both that the pandemic uh, brings people's awareness to this issue, but also that at a local level, uh, restaurants and um, consumer, regular consumers and supermarkets may be starting to figure out where they might be able to work around the existing supply chain. Is there a local farm uh, just outside the city that they might be able to partner with whose traditional business delivering to a certain restaurant has been disrupted or something like that? So if those links can be established as these farms search for new outlets, then maybe that's the basis uh, for a new system going forward. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just wanted to ask one final thing. Chris, you had said you think it's going to continue to get worse through June and July, just because you think the concentration in factories is just starting and is not going to be mitigated? Well, they don't have a plan. Yeah. You know, check out uh, Leah Douglas is a reporter with the Food and Environment Reporting Network yeah. documenting cases of COVID. You know, and I mean, we have, you know, John Tyson tried to pressure Donald Trump into, you know, putting down this Defense Act uh, executive order to basically force these employees to go back on the job regardless of the COVID risks. And what I see, what's, hap what's happening now is that these people are just having to go back to work to keep the system running with yeah. minimal protections for their safety. And tragically, that's going to mean people are going to continue to get sick and production is going to be continued to be hindered. So I don't think that we're at the end of the problem in the meat system by any means. I, I think that I don't want this to be the case, but I think we could see an intensification of this problem in the June and July as, as we go forward. Yeah, that makes sense and is also alarming. <laughs> Um, all right. Thank you, everybody, so much for joining us. Um, we have more social distancing socials on Tuesdays and Thursdays, so we hope that you will all come back. Thanks so much.